Hello, I'm Toy Cat, and welcome back to the second channel video. Did you know that I live under a monarchy right now? If not, you probably should because it's literally called the United Kingdom. However, a lot of people forget because we do still hold elections, we are still democratic, it's just a constitutional monarchy. And a lot of people forget that a lot of the world is still part of a monarchy, and this map shows you just how many countries are kingdoms versus republics. Republics outnumber kingdoms by quite a bit, except wait a minute, this isn't the real map. This right here is the real map of republics versus monarchies. Republics in blue, monarchies in red, and we're going to ignore purple because, uh, you know, like Western Sahara just ruins every map with their weird, we don't know how to map this status effectively. And you know what, I'm just saying, if I was a powerful country in the world, you know what I would do to fix all maps that have this no data or this confusing data? I might just go in there and fix this problem for myself. And I know if you're the United States, you're thinking, darn, we can't do that because we just recognized Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. But you know what you should just do is say, well, We've decided we recognize your, you know, your, your sovereignty, but we're also going to take it now. And then, boom, Western Sahara makes a lovely 51st state. And, uh, you know, look at that. It's, like, so geographically connected. And you could build a lovely bridge out there. There's a lot of good ideas, I'm just saying. U.S. Uh, Department of Defense uh, hit me up. But in the meantime, let's look at this map and acknowledge that, uh, more seriously, uh, there are a lot more blue countries than red countries. There are a lot more uh, countries which are fully democratic than countries which are monarchies. You know the system of government from, like, the 1100s where a guy, a, a, guy or a person is in charge because their dad was in charge and that it just continuously goes up that way? That is the system we use in the red parts of the world, including me right here. However, here's the interesting thing. It sounds so much less democratic, but if you take a quick little glance at the uh, the democracy um, uh, index, so this is uh, what it does. It tries to rank qu countries by the quality of democracy, with zero being absolutely no democratic input from the people, and one being a perfect, pure democracy. When you look at this list, you'll see that the most democratic country in the world is Denmark. Denmark, by the way, just to just to mention, the Kingdom of Denmark. <laughs> it is a, uh, it, it, it's, it's literally, by the way, this map right here, if you're curious what it was, this is a map of countries which use their title uh, in their country name. So they, this is a kingdom, this is a kingdom, this is a republic, just, just in case you're curious. You, you know, most maps do put their kingdom, or most uh, countries put their republic or kingdom status right up there in their title. Although it does have to be said, the black countries, a, a cool, cool batch of countries and Bolivia. But um, yeah, if you look at the, um, if you look very interestingly, you can see that like actually the red countries do really well. Country number two, second most democratic country in the world is the kingdom of Norway. The fourth most democratic country in the world, the Kingdom of Sweden. Even outside of the Nordics, there is the Kingdom of the Netherlands, there is New Zealand, there is the Kingdom of Belgium. Six of the top ten most democratic countries on Earth are actually not dem democracies. They are constitutional monarchies. What, what, how does that make any sense? In fact, it's even weirder because, uh, you know, it's strange enough in my opinion that top of the top ten, six of them are monarchies, despite monarchies being much uh, rarer uh, than, than, than republics. But if you go to the bottom 20, of the bottom 20 countries, all but two are actually republics, are officially countries where there is a direct democracy. The only exceptions are Qatar at 169 and Saudi Arabia at 173. You know, you know Saudi Arabia, the country, just to clarify, which is named not after, like, you know, a lot of people get this mixed up, like, oh yeah, the whole place is called Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, that makes sense. It's, yeah, it's the Arabian Peninsula, and then the family that rule it, the current monarchs, are the House of Saud. They called their country, like, half of their country's title is actually the family that own it. It'd be the same as if it wasn't the United Kingdom, it was the Elizabethan uh, lands of England, Scotland, and Wales, or whatever. Like, yeah, that is what it would be like, except that is what it really just is over in Saudi Arabia. And yet they are still, somehow, despite that, not the least democratic country on Earth. And ignoring, like, North Korea, and like, it's, it's still quite shocking that you can score below Saudi Arabia. Just have to say, the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea clearly is not actually very democratic and does not belong to the people and is not probably a republic based on this hard autocracy st uh, status that it has. But yeah, most of these countries are republics if you take a little uh, look on the list. And I think that's just fascinating personally. What I also think is so fascinating when we take a little glance back at the, uh, the map right here is the fact that like, yeah, of the countries in red, you know, monarchs using this weird outdated system, they're all doing pretty well off. I mean, like the worst off country in this entire list, what is it? It's gonna be like all the way over here, 
Bhutan, maybe? You know, the one red country in a sea of blue. But Bhutan is famously quite happy. They are they are doing fairly well for a country, even if some economic indicators don't point to that. Um, and then outside of that, it's like, it's either... By the way, I, I know you can, you can never see yourself, New Zealand. Here you go. Are you happy now, New Zealand? So there, we, there we go. That'll, that'll keep the New Zealanders happy for a little bit. Uh, there's always New Zealanders in the comments being like, you block us. I had to block one corner off the map. It's either Argentina or you, uh, New Zealand. And as much as I... Uh, you know, I, I'm just saying, I'm sorry. I, I hate to do this to you, New Zealand. You're not worth it. But looking at the countries on the uh, on the earth, which of these would you say is doing the worst? Maybe it, maybe one of the oceanic territories, like the Solomon Islands. Maybe one of the Caribbean islands. But out of the major ones, probably Papua New Guinea, right? And I'm embarrassed to admit, I was like, I know Papua New Guinea can't be part of the Commonwealth. So who's their king? And I looked up who the king of uh, Papua New Guinea was. And apparently it's this woman. So very sexist of me to assume it would be a king. But also, uh, is, isn't that kind of crazy, huh? So yeah, as it turns out, countries that are uh, monarchies are, you know, like, they seem to do quite well for themselves. In fact, um, an, an interesting little side note, by the way, because how is it that they're also uh, democratic? You'd assume maybe it's like, oh, it's an elective monarchy. They, It's a monarchy system, but the monarch is elected. But no, that falls under the idea of a republic. There are a lot of countries where there is a president who has all the roles of the monarch, but he's elected. And uh, yeah, in fact, if you look at all of the types of monarchy, uh, there is no elective monarchy anywhere on the planet. You can see how there is... Um, Interestingly enough, there's a lot of constitutional monarchies. Uh, there is uh, a lot of the Commonwealth realms, where it's this weird constitutional personal union, where the only reason they're the same, uh, you know, like monarch, the only reason they're linked in any way at all is because the same monarch has to be, happens to be in charge of them. And then there is a couple of mixed monarchies and absolute monarchies. Just to clarify here again, with Saudi Arabia, it's literally a monarchy in the sense of, oh, not they have a king. It's like, no, they have a king and he is in charge. The, 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 the Saud family literally control what happens in Saudi Arabia and his like 10 to 40,000 closest relatives. That is the way that country is run, as well as to a lesser extent Oman. Um, there's the UAE and there's Qatar who have a mostly, you know, like head of state that's based that way. Uh, uh, Sultan's not the word, but uh, it's an, an, an emir, I think. Um, there, there's, there is a guy in charge, whatever his title is. It doesn't matter that much. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that there's a ton of types of republics, right? So this is just going off titles, but like, so there's there's republics, like in the case of, uh, you know, the, there's the Republic of, uh, like, Brazil or, like, uh, you know, whatever else. But there's also, uh, like, you know, Republic of France, the Republic of Italy. Then there's countries that go a little step further, like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Which, side note, there's a Democratic Republic of Congo and a Republic of Congo. And I hate to tell you this, but if you scroll down the list and you look for them, I'm, I'm going to find them down here, right? Uh, Republic of Congo. Whoa, actually... Democratic Republic of Congo gets 11 places on... The only difference between these countries, I swear, there's literally one, is the fact that Congo put Democratic in their title. They jumped 11 rankings on the list. I'm just saying, you want to make your country more democratic? You put that in that in your title, damn it. There's also the Democratic People's Republic of, which is used mostly by countries that are very heavily communist bent and aren't very democratic or People's Republics. Uh, so North Korea or uh, Laos, kind of the last places where... Socialism, communism, whatever you want to call it, have like real footholds in a way that is unique not to China. And then uh, there is, of course, my favorite Sri Lanka, the Democratic uh, Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, uh, which, fun fact, is uh, not very socialist, as best I can tell. Also, not a very good republic either. So, yeah, you can see looking at this list, there's a lot of types of republics, there's a lot of types of monarchy, and also, whatever this map shows, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> I didn't know what it was until I loaded it up. Uh, this is a map I wanted to show interestingly, because I do want to say that even, you know, like, when you look at this map, it's clear that countries in red are doing better than countries in blue as an aggregate. However, when you include China and North Korea in blue, it's a little bit misleading. So this map kind of separates countries into one party versus two party versus multi-party systems. So even if you just, if you take away all the one party states, even if you take away all the two party states, because you don't think that's true democracy, uh, even if you just have the multi-party democracy system, even of those, the countries which have a king, the countries which have a monarch, do better than the countries that don't have a monarch as an aggregate, which is absolutely insane. So what is the explanation for this? The best one that I, uh, you know, like, because I, I looked into this a lot. This is one of those big fascinations of mine. How is it that monarchs do better than not when, just to, just to, remind, just to remind you here, uh, the, she is in charge of, she, is, she, she, she makes the rules and stuff. So I found this great unbiased website called The Crown Chronicles, who of course, 
course, are unbiased about why constitutional monarchy is the best form of government. And, uh, you know, they, they had some interesting enough arguments. I, I don't know if I necessarily agreed with all of them. Like, countries and monarchies are less corrupt and more trusting. But it's like, no, 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 this is... Yeah, I mean, you, you're misunderstanding the the way the correlation goes. Like I like even though that might be true, and it sounds like it is, I'll trust the Crown Chronicles. It's like does does being a constitutional monarchy make them that? Does is being a monarch actually good for the economy? Is is monarchs do monarchs really have morals, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? It just makes sense. What do you mean? It just makes sense that someone's in charge of the country just because ah okay so okay the crown chronicles you can't trust but vox has a very uh yeah, everyone knows they've got a left-leaning bent right and so uh, in general you'd expect them to come out against monarchs because it is just a woman who wears diamonds and sits in a gold seat and announces what happens in the country but uh even even they say yeah monarchies are actually better than republics and um they've got a really interesting point that monarchies end up being more democratically legitimate it seems kind of silly to say but countries which have a head of state are usually, you know, like, a, they're elected by some form of party, and so that means they don't necessarily reflect the public mood at the time, they reflect the public mood at the election, but also, constitutional monarchies somehow, despite everything seeming like it should point to the contrary, are more democratically accountable. So, when there is a, you know, when there's a issue going on with the government, where, because, you know, the, the way monarchs work, the way a head of state works, be that the uh, you know, like the the president of of um, Italy or the the king of uh, Spain. Uh, what happens is when a government needs to be formed, you don't form the government without asking and getting permission. They also pass all the bills, but they they kind of just rubber stamp it. But like, you need to have the Queen's permission to pass laws in the UK and to form a government. And so when you go to the Queen and say, "Oh, there's been an issue." What, here's what I'm going to do. She can say no. She can insist that instead you hold an election uh, or that insist that instead of that, what you should do is you should have a cabinet reshuffle. And it seems as though when the president is elected, they try to keep the current party in charge for longer with more cabinet reshuffles, just, just replacing the existing government. Whereas constitutional monarchies seem to more often hold early elections, letting the people decide rather than letting politicians decide, which doesn't make, again, that, that that's wacky, but it's a good point. They also argue that although the biggest argument against them is cost, the royal family costs 299 million pounds a year um, to the UK, whereas uh, Germany's president costs just 26 million. And so therefore, 270 million, that's the big reason against it that you can objectively, empirically point to. But even then, in Spain, the monarchy costs them only 8 million pounds a year. And also, even if you wanted to argue on cost savings grounds, we have to get rid of it. When you look at this map of UK government spending, this is for one year, by the way, um, it's like, yeah, you could save 290 million by taking 0.1% of this budget, or like, you know, 1%, take 1% of the debt interest, just make slightly better financial decisions as a country, um, and then you could, you know, there, there you go, you've, you've, you've got your stuff sorted, or defense, or industry, or whatever else. Uh, in reality, most people who are probably advocating for removing the monarchy don't think, oh, we need to save this money, they think we need to throw it at something else, or maybe they don't even think that, they just think, oh, well, I like not spending money on a woman who sits in a chair made of gold and diamonds, which I'd like to very, be clear, I agree with that on. Ultimately, it's very, very hard to find something that really backs up anything, besides saying that even though it should be entirely the contrary, uh, countries, if we sort by uh, happiness, the happiest countries in the world and the most democratic countries in the world do seem to continuously come up as uh, monarchies. Somehow, this doesn't ruin them. And so my best theory after reading lots of, like, half-truths, again, like, it is true that they're more democratically accountable, but I don't see why they have to be. Uh, it is true, um, you know, that they're less corrupt, but it doesn't, or that they can unite the people, but I don't see why you can't have someone else that does that. So uh, instead, my best theory when looking at this map and trying to analyze what do countries in red do better than countries in blue, honestly, I think it's country age. I think the one thing that you can say is definitely the causation I guess it's also a correlation, but it's like monarchies tend to be a longer lasting form of government or maybe even rather the oldest countries have existed since the time where monarchs were the norm. And so at, they have had a form of government that has been stable for that entire time. Whereas new countries, when they come about, not only do they put republic in their name, but also they become republics. And so there is a big like negative, you know, like uh, there's a big negative adjustment for republics because they're often so new. All of the newest countries in the world, with very few exceptions, choose to become 
um, you know, like uh, republics where the people decide. Because if you're making a new government from scratch, why would you? In fact, it's really weird when you look into the monarchy of Papua New Guinea because, oh, it's, I always say Papua New Guinea, but it's more like, you know, Papua New Guinea it is. Anyway, so when you look at them, they were like, we're gonna go independent. We're gonna like work out an elected head of state or something. And then just like against everyone's expectations, it was like, yeah, I guess we'll just have the queen come in. You know, like we could, we could have an elected person, but they wanted to have a monarchy still. They wanted to have, uh, you know, people liked the queen. They wanted her to be politically neutral and they wanted to have all the knighthoods and decorations feel like they're not a part of the political establishment, but a part of something greater, something older, uh, I guess you could say. And so they did it. Uh, according to historian Robert Hardman, Papua New Guinea is the one part of the world where the queen is effectively an elected monarch. Something, by the way, I want to entirely disagree with, because you know what happens when she dies? The person who comes in charge is not based on their wants, it's based on United Kingdom law, and so this guy becomes the new monarch, the king of Papua New Guinea, which is what I actually searched to find this. Do you, do you not believe me? Let, let me show you my Google search. It is Papua New Guinea king. <laughs> this is the king of Papua New Guinea, if, you, if you'll believe it. If you'll believe it. Anyway, so, um... I think, that, I think the one thing you can say with absolute certainty is that red countries, to still have kings in this age, have gone on quite some time, right? Uh, they've gone through different forms of government, but there's been a continuity in a way that, that you know, there isn't a continuity between, uh, you know, like uh, Estonia or Ukraine's, uh, you know, like former government and their current one. There might not even be territory. In fact, there is definitively not territorial continuity with Ukraine because of that bad thing Russia did. No, 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 not, not, not that bad thing. The bad thing before where they took that whole peninsula uh, from them and everyone did nothing. Um, like that, that, uh, you know, like this, this, which part, which country is a part of? Let's, let's make that nice and vague. But, um, it's, uh, like, I, I, I think that in general, the older a country is, the more stable it can be. And the more stable a country it is, the better it is economically. And, you know, even though we might like to tell ourselves otherwise, the, every country in the happiest one on this list. Well, let me find the first poor country in here. You have to scroll down quite a while to find a poor country that is happy. And, uh, conversely, what do countries that are unhappy have in common? I mean, there's some, like, medium wealth ones in here. You can be unhappy and rich, but being rich probably helps a lot with being happy. Anyway, so, um, yeah, with that said, I don't think the monarchs actually help, but I do think getting rid of it just for the sake of getting rid of it might be silly, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I always, whenever I hear the statistic, the only, like, I always think only 17% of the UK are against this. This? Do you see what we're looking at here? And it's like, yeah... You know, I, I, in general, you try not to touch things just for the sake of principally that seems wrong. You try to touch things because you think it is a good idea for the future. I might disagree with, and uh, like, lots of points on this, but if you are to change things, you slightly tweak a few things. You don't scrap the whole pie chart and say, now we've got 500 billion, how are we going to spend it? Actually, wait, more than 500. This is like most of a trillion, right? You've got a trillion pounds you can spend every year as the government, but in reality, you can't spend that many because it's already been pre-committed to all these places. Um, but maybe we'd be happier if we wipe the slate clean. Or maybe we should just say that everything is how it is right now, and sometimes, even though it's insane, it's perfectly okay. I don't know what the actual conclusion is here. I just think it's interesting. Uh, but also, I want to mention before we go here, um, a lot of people were a little bit upset because I have been... You know, against my promises, I said the quality on this channel would never get better. I have been using an editor uh, for a few videos here and there, probably a couple in the future too. Uh, it is something uh, that I'm exploring a little bit here, and so I'd like to address my blatant lie to all of you when I said that I would take the money and just spend it on selfish indulgences, and then I accidentally spent some on this channel. That was a big mistake. I would like to apologize sincerely. Like, I... I messed up and I made a big dishonesty and I'd like to apologize to anyone who's been affected. I know a lot of people looked at the editing and they're like, oh, why are you adding, adding to the video here so I can't? But I do think there is a more serious criticism of like, oh, I'm not sure if I like editing and I don't like the idea of going more produced because I like that this is an authentic conversation that we're having right here. That's one of the things I like about this. I'm, I'm just talking directly into you, Mr. Camera, um, or sorry, Steve, Jill, Tom. Yeah, I got one of your names there. Um, it's a one-to-one -one conversation. That's what I like about YouTube, these long-form discussions. And I think that's the important thing. Like, if, if, if I edited a picture of... I'm, I'm not going to edit this video. Imagine, though, in your mind, there's, like, a picture of 
a man on the moon and uh, also the North Korean president, uh, you know, filleting the astronaut. Like, you know, like, it, you, you might think to yourself, like, oh, wow, that's an improvement on the video if he's there. Uh, but it, oh, it's not an improvement that I had to imagine that. But in reality, I think editing can just be these subtle touches. And I think for this channel, it's important to do two things. One is use editing to help drive home a point. If there's a map that I don't have, Adding it in later can be really cool. But second of all, the second important thing is these long uncut six segments are good. It can be really easy to just say to yourself like, you know, because a lot of YouTubers have these big gaps and clear jump cuts like, so I was talking the other day about things and uh, let me tell you my opinion on, uh, on, on Venezuela. And then you think and you come up with it and you're like, yeah, Venezuela has an economy that is good. And then you, you oh, <laughs> it's not by the way, <laughs> that's a lie. Um, but it's very easy to say stuff like this uh, and to take these breaks where you think about what you're going to say and then you say it later. But then when you do that, you kind of lose some stuff. Like, so let me tell you what I really think right now. I think that my least favorite group of people are, um, I, I just, I really hate, I've never heard this term before. I, I just really think that like, man, these, these darn bounty, <laughs> oh God, oh man. I see how that, okay, you know what, man, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of words I didn't know about, huh? Um, it's, it's always good to check up on the list, make sure you're not saying something uh, wrong. But like, you know, isn't it better if you just, uh, oh, no, oh, oh gosh, what did I just show you? Um, here's, here's the king of Papua New Guinea again. Um, but yeah, no, I, um, I wanna make it clear that these videos are just my direct thoughts to you. We're gonna edit some things here and there. If a video crashes, we can even stitch some things together. But I like the idea of long and cut conversations. And if you like them too, don't worry, they're gonna continue. Just sometimes we're gonna have editing. But don't worry, this video, no edits whatsoever. And probably the next one too, uh, unless it's the, a vlog. I, I, I did a very long journey for a vlog. You know, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Second channel, don't care, bye.